Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank each and every one of you for being here with us at this live session from Massa University, Sajjana Butra Campus. I am Priya Kesar, lecturer at the Faculty of Health Sciences, Massa University, and I will be moderating today's session. Today's webinar is on the topic of shoulder tendinopathy and is probably organized by the Faculty of Health Sciences, Massa University. So, dear viewers, before we proceed further, I would like to give you a brief overview of the programs which are offered by the Faculty of Health Sciences at Massa University. So, in the Faculty of Health Sciences, we have three departments, physiotherapy, environmental health, and medical imaging. Uh, for the Faculty of Health Sciences, we have School of Physiotherapy, Department of Environmental Health Sciences and Department of Medical Imaging. Why we want to join these health sciences? Because of this wide stream, high job demand, no boring work routine, no low risk of job or career you can feel good about and you can work in a wide variety of settings. And infinite excellence is what Massa University aspires to to each of its graduates. We have three uh, departments, School of Physiotherapy, Environmental Health, and the Department of Medical Imaging. In Physiotherapy, we have Diploma, Bachelor Program, Bachelor of Physiotherapy Honors, which is online distance learning program. And we have Masters of Physiotherapy also. In Environmental Health Sciences, we have Diploma in Occupational Sciences. Then we have Department Diploma in Environmental Health, Bachelor of Environmental Safety. In medical imaging, we have diploma in medical imaging and we have bachelors of imaging honors. For the masters of physiotherapy, we have one year program which is full time entry requirements. We have program which is for the diploma. The three-year program of three requirements for the for the Bachelor of Physics, which is also four-year program and three-year program are the entry requirements. So, viewers, if you are in
sorry for this technical errors viewers so i would like to uh, start with the webinar for today's topic which is on shoulder tendinopathy so as we all know shoulder pain is one of the very common debilitating condition and the present evidence suggests that the shoulder tendinopathy is the most common cause of the shoulder pain so physiotherapy plays a very vital role in its management and this webinar aims to discuss about the common causes of the shoulder pain and its different treatment strategies which are employed in the physiotherapy so today we have with us dr subhash khatri for today's webinar dr subhash khatri holds phd in sports sciences uh, from guru nanak dev university amritsar india and he also has a master's degree in orthopedic physiotherapy dr khatri has more than 22 years of experience in academics research and clinical physiotherapy as well he has over 88 publications in various national as well as international journals so welcome dr khatri thank you priya thank you sir good afternoon all of you i'm sure i'm audible at the outset i'd like to thank priya and nasa university for giving this wonderful opportunity to interact with all of you on a kind of very interesting topic i call it as a shoulder tendinopathy at the outset as a physiotherapist before you are going to put on your hands on to someone's shoulder just ask this question is it appropriate for me to touch someone's shoulder the answer is yes go ahead the answer is no just stop there what i mean here is to look for red flags but the question comes is whether the patient has a shoulder problem we all know that the shoulder is one of uh, the common disabling condition but the question comes is how to screen how to do the rapid examination and one of the simple way is to form the shoulder ridge test just ask the patient to try to touch the fingers on the back of shoulder and look for these three things so just ask yourself a question if i'm going to ask a person to perform the shoulder ridge test when i'm going to call it as a positive test am i going to look for pain in am i going to look for inability am i going to look for difficulty or in addition to that i have added here one more stuff it's called support or this all of us so what do you think when patient has got a problem in shoulder ridge test it's possible that patient complains of pain inability difficulty or support so when you see all of us it's appear it's going to appear that your patient has got a shoulder issue the shoulder is the third most common musculoskeletal problem that is seen by physiotherapists uh, the question comes is which one is the first and which one is the second obviously the answer is low back pain and the neck pain and the third is always the shoulder so as a physiotherapist when you are into orthopedic practice you are going to see every third patient with a shoulder problem so what are the common causes of the shoulder problem okay i call it as a dot that is degeneration overuse and trauma just ask the patient what's your age if the patient's age is about 60 you can suspect degenerative kind of pathology ask a patient what's your occupation if your patient tells you that he is an athlete okay that suggests that there's a overuse ask for the history of trauma that is fall accident injury if your patient says yes to that then it's traumatic cause so we have apparently three causes i call it as dot degeneration overuse and trauma well most of the time non traumatic otherwise traumatic issues around the shoulder i call it as doctor f issues when i say doctor f issues uh, b stands for dislocation r stands for rotator cuff and f stands for frozen shoulder so most of the time subluxation dislocation otherwise sprains and strains are a group of entities then rotator cuff tendinitis or rotator cuff tendinopathy or otherwise rotator cuff degeneration are mostly the rotator cuff issues including partial tear or complete tear frozen i'm sure you all know that pain and stiffness uh, suggests that 
the patient might have a kind of condition we call the frozen shoulder. Well, when you look at rotator cuff, that is what we are going to discuss today. We look for three common pathologies. One is inflammation, second is degeneration, and third one is tear. For today's presentation, uh, we'd like to focus more on degeneration. So let's look at this. It's like three T, uh, tendinitis, tendinopathy, and tear. And today, we'd, we'd like to focus on tendinopathy of the rotator cuff and especially the shoulder itself. Well, at the outset, uh, the question comes is, so what is the definition? Well, look at the person who's uh, put up this, that's Levis. Now, what he says, he says that pain and weakness mostly experienced on external rotation and elevation due to excessive load on rotator cuff tissues. Well, let me make it very simple. Just look at three E, external rotation, elevation, and excessive load. And look for those two features, pain and weakness. So surprisingly, instead of stiffness, which you see it in a condition like frozen shoulder, here the complaint is pain and weakness. And look for that uh, triple E, external rotation, elevation, and excessive load. Okay, so what are the precipitating factors? I call it as a triple O, overload, overuse, and overstretch. Just imagine that you wanted to travel and all of a sudden you had to lift up a bag which was quite heavy, that suggests overload. Overuse, imagine you are a recreational athlete and one fine day you played for more than an hour, that's like overuse. Then overstretch, just imagine that you got up in the morning, you are not even prepared and all of a sudden you had to uh, say, uh, perform an activity like throwing something. So it's like overstretch. So these are the three precipitating factors. We call it as overload, overuse, and overstretch. Well, let's go into the depth and look at these precipitating factors. They can be OMAG. I call it as obesity, metabolic diseases, age, and diabetes. Well, here's a big list of precipitating factors. I'll skip this. Normally, that red wheel and the green wheel keeps functioning. That means there's wear and tear and there's a healing. What happens if the blue wheel comes there, that is there's an excessive load, then the rotator cuff goes into so-called rotator cuff tendinopathy. So the key here is that blue wheel, that is excessive load. Now let's go into the pathology of rotator cuff tendinopathy. Basically all of these changes could be intrinsic or extrinsic. When I say intrinsic, that's related to tendon, like tendon vascularity, tendon morphology, say the content of the tendon. And extrinsic, look at the factors related to scapular muscles or the best effects. Now let's look at what it happens in a pictorial view. Now let me put it in a very simple way. Uh, rotator cuff is comprising three major things such as uh, say bone, uh, tendons and the muscle and it functions like a spring. Normally what happens is when there is an appropriate loading, there's an adaptation to that load and there's a strengthening and this is how the normal tendons in rotator cuff is maintained. Now what happens if the rotator cuff is unloaded, it creates a stress and the rotator cuff becomes a reactive. Now the reactive rotator cuff goes in disrepair, characterized by collagen uh, disorganization, cell separation, plus matrix. And if there's an excessive load, this goes to neovascularization. When I say neovascularization, there's an addition of uh, cells we call it the angiofibroblast. So what's the key? Key is very simple. When the tendon is reactive, you modify the load, it becomes normal. But if we can't modify, when a patient has got reactive rotator cuff tendon and we fail to modify the load, uh, the tendon goes into degeneration. So let's summarize what I spoke. I said that rotator cuff is like a spring. Inactivity leads to changes like angiofibroblast. Uh, there has to be optimal loading. And if we do the optimal loading, it becomes normal, but if we fail to do the optimal loading, there's a degeneration. 
So when you see a patient, it's apparent that you ask the patient, where's your pain? And quite commonly, a patient is going to show the pain in three regions. We call it the A, D, J. That is acromion, deltoid, and joint line. When your patient has got rotator cuff tendinopathy, quite commonly, your patient is going to show the pain over the deltoid region. And that I call it as a palm sign. That means your patient is going to show the pain with a palm. But remember one thing, that whenever your patient has got the shoulder pain, because of a condition like rotator cuff tendinopathy, that pain is never going to go below the elbow. So our rule is very simple, that shoulder pain never radiates below the elbow. And if it radiates below the elbow, it's got to be cervical, not the shoulder. So let's come back. A patient who has got rotator cuff tendinopathy is going to have pain mostly in the shoulder region, all the way up to, say, max elbow, but never below the elbow. So if you ask, how's your pain? Patient says, I get dull aching pain. I'm sure you can appreciate that this is the short. When we say dull aching pain, your patient is like, oh, I have little pain. So your patient can't say that I don't have pain. At the same time, your patient doesn't have so much pain also. So it's like neither pain free, nor too much of pain. That kind of aching keeps on happening in a patient who has got rotator cuff in the back. Now patient finds it difficult to perform movements such as arm behind the back or the arm behind, say, the neck. So it happens that your patient finds difficulty in activities of daily living such as combing, others reaching to the back pocket and so on and so forth. Now this is an interesting part. Your patient finds difficulty in sleeping. Especially what happens is just imagine that your patient has got left rotator cuff tendinopathy and your patient is used to sleep on to the left side. Now what happens? The sleep gets disturbed. Your patient gets up in the night because of the shoulder pain. So one of the key here is very simple. We got to have a kind of plan to help the patient. Now imagine that your patient tried sleeping on the other side and it's not going to help the patient. Your patient feels sleepy only on to the left side and left side only has got a problem. Then we can modify the position. We can just ask the patient to take the pillow on the back side uh, and turn it with a quarter so that we can minimize the compressive forces over the left shoulder. Other way could be your patient can have self-care. So before going to the bed, your patient can have some kind of, uh, say, hot water fermentation, or otherwise active exercises, so that your patient is comfortable and patient can sleep. In between also, if your patient gets up from the sleep because of the pain, then your patient should have the self-help plans such as NSAIDs, and then the heating kind of superficial agent, and some kind of active exercises, so that you can minimize the discomfort that is associated with sleeping. Now slowly what happens is patient finds difficulty in almost all activities of daily living. I call it as the ABCDE, that is ambulation, bathing, cleaning, communication, dressing, eating, and even sleeping, just now we have seen. Now, most of the time, we tend to perform varieties of the spatial tests, such as empty can test, otherwise um, uh, Kennedy's test. But I found that one of the best ones is uh, ask the patient to perform the belly press. Now, when you perform the belly press, what you can see is there's a difference in angle, especially I'm sure you can see the wrist here and the hand, okay? So when you ask the patient to press the belly onto the affected side, uh, the angle difference is more than 10% as compared to the normal side. So when your patient finds it really difficult and to put that wrist and hand in the same angle, uh, you can guess that your patient has got rotator cuff tendinopathy. Now in order to look at the outcome measurements, one of my personal favorites is FADI, that I call the shoulder pain and disability index. The beauty of this paddy is you can assess the pain as well as disability component and even together also. So one of the investigations that we do in a patient who comes with a rotator cuff tendinopathy is musculoskeletal sonography. In some countries, uh, physiotherapists are allowed to perform the musculoskeletal sonography including sonography of rotator cuff. Now the question here is to find out which muscle and to what extent it is causing pain or discomfort. Now, when you look at MRI, you can see the changes such as there's a focal lesion, it is inhomogeneous, 
there's an increase in the tendon signal without any frac fluid. I'm sure that this is like complicated way to put up the MRI findings. So let me make it easy. You're going to look for two F. One F you want to see and another F you don't want to see. So you want to see the focal lesion, but you don't want to see the fluid. Because if you see the fluid, it's like more of inflammatory change. And you want to see just what F that is focal lesion. So once again, the key is two F. You want to see one F and you don't want to see another F. So you want to see the focal lesion, but you don't want to see the fluid. Now, obviously, the differential diagnosis is with one of the key uh, conditions that almost mimics is frozen shoulder. And when you want to differentiate with the frozen shoulder, I hope you remember in the beginning I said the patient's complaint is pain and weakness and the triple E. But in frozen shoulder, this is what it happens. Your patient has got multiplanar issue, such as pain and stiffness, and it is asymmetrical, suggesting capillar pattern. I call it the MAC. So every single time you come across a patient who has got multiplanar pain and restriction, which is asymmetrical, that goes more in favor of frozen shoulder. Now, another way to differentiate whether your patient has got the visceral uh, cause of shoulder pain is look for this RMP. R is for rest, M is for moment, and P is for position or the posture change. Remember that musculoskeletal pain is always altered by R and P, that is rest, moment, and position or the posture change. But your patient's shoulder pain is not altered by R and P such as rest, moment, and position, it suggests that it is visceral. So once again, let me tell you that visceral pain is not altered by rest, moment, and position. So next time you come across a patient who has got a shoulder pain, say left shoulder pain, which is not altered by RMP, you can suspect that your patient has got visceral pathology. One of the tricks is perform shoulder abduction test. That is just ask the patient to perform the shoulder abduction and if shoulder abduction test reduces the patient's shoulder pain, then you can suspect that uh, the pathology is in cervical spine. Now, another quick way is perform the overhead movement. If overhead movement reduces the shoulder pain, then it suggests that the problem is in cervical spine. Because you know that most of the shoulder pathologies, what happens is when the patient performs the overhead movement, it causes the discomfort, it causes the pain. But on the contrary, if overhead movement reduces the shoulder pain, then you can suspect that pathology is in cervical spine. Now, another interesting test in this area is drop arm test. If your patient has got painless drop arm test positive, that means when you ask the patient to perform the abduction and hold it, uh, the arm just helplessly fall down. We call it as drop arm test positive. So if it is painless drop arm test positive, you can suspect that your patient has got complete rotator cuff tear. But on the contrary, on drop arm test, while lowering down the arm, if the patient gets a lot of pain, then you can suspect that your patient has got partial rotator cuff tear. So remember two things. Painless drop arm test positive, such as that there is a complete rotator cuff tear. And if your patient has got pain on drop arm test, it suggests that there's a partial rotator cuff tear. Well, our key is very simple here in order to treat the patient who has got a problem is just the relief of symptoms. Now, medical management you can look at can be in terms of NSAIDs, that's painkillers, intraarticular injection with corticosteroids, and other therapies. I'm not sure about the evidence for this therapy. We call it as a, a growth factor injection. Then another option is uh, sclerotherapy, that is putting sclerosing agents into the shoulder. Uh, stem cell therapy. Once again, I'm not aware about the evidence for that. When we look at the physiotherapy, varieties of the options are there, such as ultrasound therapy. Others you can use uh, perfectly, phonophoresis, extracorporeal shockwave therapy, especially when your patient has got calcific deposits into the rotator cuff tendons, such as uh, supraspinatus. One of the uh, old age uh, kind of you know treatment option is pendular exercises, otherwise we call it as Goldman's exercises. A technical term you can use it as active assisted exercise, isometrics is one of the key in treating the patient with the rotator cuff, tendinopathies. Obviously, strengthening remains the prime goal. A capsule stretching, you can think about it. In addition to that, you can correct some training errors. You can also think about uh, the options such as uh, prolotherapy, that is uh, 
autologous blood that is injected. Of course, that's part of orthopedic management there. In my textbook, I have written this. I call it the MAMA approach. That MAMA stands for modality, appliances, movements, and advice. So you got to take a decision. What kind of modality I'm going to use for this patient? What kind of appliance may be required? What kind of movements I have to choose? And what kind of advice I had to give? That is what to do and what not to do. If your patient has got acute uh, kind of presentation, then one of the best options could be epicolon spray. A taping right now, there's not much more evidence for the taping. But one of the quickest way to correct, uh, say, uh, shoulder alignment, especially the scapular position, that is possible with the tape. Now, this is extracorporeal shock therapy. And already I said that in case your patient has got some calcific deposits, you can choose extracorporeal shock therapy. Microdiet therapy, M for M. M for microwave, M for muscle. So when we suspect that pathology is in the muscle group, such as rotator cuff, one of the best um, option to accelerate the healing of rotator cuff pathology is microdiatomy. Now, therapeutic options, this is movements, uh, this in terms of SNS, that is stability exercises, mobility exercises, always strengthening exercises. But remember that every single time when your patient has got active movement painful, uh, the key is active assisted exercise. So mind well that your patient has got active movement painful, your key of the treatment is active assisted exercise. Now it's up to you how to do the assistance. That can be with the patient's opposite hand, that can be manual assistance, that can be van, that can be travel, that can be say uh, therapeutic options such as uh, red cord, otherwise suspension, otherwise overhead pulley and so on and so forth. But remember that active movement is painful, your best option is active assisted exercise there. Now, this is a traditional way of uh, strengthening the rotator cuff group of muscles. But you know that concentric uh, way of strengthening that too with the old methods such as dumbbell, that is one of the slower fashion kind of rotator cuff strengthening. So one of the best options is eccentric uh, kind of resistance exercises. And you can use very well uh, thera band or there's any exercise bands. And you can choose why the colors like from uh, say yellow, red, green. Other is blue, black, silver, gold, with an increase in the resistance. The key is, uh, like initially, you can just have a trial and error to choose the color code, and then you can start working on uh, eccentric way of stuttering, which is a little fast. Now, this is not directly related to uh, rotator cuff, but this is related with uh, patella tendinopathy. And this research says that isometric is one of the best options. Surprisingly, this research says that isometric benefit is done for a long period of time. Traditionally, we do it for five to 10 seconds full time. And then we have three times rest in between. That means, say, if full time is five seconds, then the rest time is five to three, 15 seconds. This is what we choose it as a therapeutic option. But this research says that if uh, full time is increased gradually to 45 seconds, uh, that has got a little better effect, especially in tendinopathies as compared to uh, using the isometrics with the smaller durations. Well, you can very well hang on to this approach, which is suggested by Jeremy Lewis, and that I can put it like this. Uh, first, you can try at working at lunohumeral joint, otherwise shoulder itself. If it's not responding, then you can think about working at the scapula. Uh, say you tried at the lunohumeral joint as well as the scapula, and it's not working, then you can look at the cervical spine uh, treatment. Uh, if that is also not working, then you can look at the thoracic spine also. And maybe you can apply a combined approach that is, uh, you can do the treatment at the glenohumeral joint, a scapula, a cervical region, otherwise thoracic spine. And just imagine that you tried all these uh, things and that's not working, then probably your patient requires someone else's help, not yours. Okay, this is the therapeutic cone that we can offer for the patient and that is in terms of education advice instructions to the patient uh, self-management strategies uh, even skin patch that's for local pain relief otherwise therapeutic exercises now the key here is very simple uh, that i call it the ila uh, i stands for isometrics l stands for loading and a stands for active assisted exercises so the key here is active assisted exercises and isometry the third key here is appropriate loading. So we don't want underloading. We don't want overloading. 
what we want is optimum load so i can say that the first line treatment for a condition like rotator cuff tendinopathy is physiotherapy the big concept here that i wanted to tell you is the structure progressive loading okay these are some of the researches that i'd like to acknowledge and i have used it for my presentation and thank you so much over to priya for q and a thank you dr subhash thank you dr subhash for this such an insightful presentation so viewers if you have any questions for the shoulder tendinopathy please leave a comment at the comment section and we are here to answer your queries so there is a question coming in doctor which is the most evidence based treatment for the for the tendinopathies okay there's a controversial kind of evidence but as of today i can even say that the isometrics uh, with a longer period of uh, uh, hold time that is up to 45 second is one of the effective strategy in treating other patients with the tendinopathy but remember that the key here is optimal loading now optimal loading i don't have a perfect answer for that question how do we decide optimal loading so answer to your question is right now isometrics and active assisted exercises are the key and if you ask me the better evidence that's for isometrics thank you okay thank you thank you dr subhash viewers if you have any questions um you can ask okay so is tendinopathy the one which uh, it responds quite slowly to exercises yeah it depends on what phase the patient comes in most of the time the patient has got presentation and patient lands up into the chronic presentation and comes to you then it really takes time say on an average it could take maximum 6 weeks for the patient to respond perfectly so answer to your question is uh, because the symptom is not so much a patient tries to hang on before say seeing a health practitioner okay so what kind of exercise can be done in home to prevent this or to relieve the pain this is a question from our audience okay answer is very simple in the presentation i showed you that rotator cuff works like a spring so if you uh, say stretch the spring too much also it's bad if you don't stretch the spring that is also bad so what i can say is that optimal loading is the key so what we should do is uh, one can have a regular rotator cuff strengthening that can be one of the way to prevent uh, the possibility of rotator cuff tendinopathy second issue is the stress and the stress comes because of underloading also and it comes because of overloading also or it comes because of some more factors which i don't know i can call it as a idk so right now answer to your question how to prevent is the key is rotator cuff strengthening and work like a spring that's it. i see okay so there is one more question coming in what when is the best time to load the tendon normally seen that we either underload the tendon or overload so is there any specific time for that okay the key is very simple as you rightly said neither underload nor overload but then when you ask the question about the time i'm not sure whether the question is as per the phase that whether i should start uh, say at acute subacute or chronic is that the question about the time i see and so if, okay. and if, if, if that is the question then best option is like say once the acute phase is over and your patient shifts into subacute phase then it's very safe for you to perform a uh, strengthening or otherwise loading as of the stretching kind of interventions so normally we need to load the tendon then exactly i see okay so are there any contraindications on performing this this is the question from the viewers here 
Okay, very good. The routine contraindications, uh, say for activity exercises, how we club uh, contraindications such as a patient having, uh, say, like I call it the ABCDE, that is ankylosis, living disorder, the patient having cancer, patient having acute dislocation, patient having, say, embolic kind of pathologies, uh, then uh, patient having acute fracture associated with, then patient having general debility, then patient who has got hypermobility, and patient who has got instability, that you could say that uh, some of the contraindications you could think about. Okay, all right. So, is there any question from the audience anymore? There is one question coming in. Which is the most important cause for RCT? Okay, if I had to answer in one one word, I'm happy with that question. It's inactivity. Yes. That's it. That's the most common cause. So second second cause can be overloading, or there is over stretch, or there is overuse. But if you ask me the first one, then inactivity. Inactivity. Okay. So. Uh, what is the duration recommended to load the tendons after the injury? Is there any duration recommended, doctor? Any opinion? Okay, uh, you have you have two ways here. One is go by the duration, and second one is go by the presentation. Okay, uh, let's uh, pick up the first one. Go by the duration. If your patient has got acute pathology and it gets subsided over the period of six weeks, then it's very simple and easy for you uh, to start with uh, strengthening and the stretching. So the first way to answer your question is, uh, say, after six weeks. But practically, what I got to do is very simple thing. I just got to perform the passive movement, uh, say, any, anything which is troublesome, for instance, the external rotation, and try to find out the relationship between the pain and the barrier. Uh, just imagine that pain comes before the barrier, then it's like acute presentation. And if the pain comes at the barrier, it's like a subacute presentation. Pain comes after the barrier, it's like a chronic presentation. So if your patient has got pain at the barrier or after the barrier, it's very safe for you to do uh, the loading or the rest strengthening. But if your patient is getting pain before the barrier, then probably you've got to be a little careful. Yes, obviously. Uh, I said that one of the precipitating factors is out of the triple O, overuse, overstretch, and maybe overloading uh, also. So imagine that if you are going to do the overloading, it can cause rotator cuff tendinopathy, provided you have another precipitating factors, such as like you are already 40 plus, that means aging is also there, then it is possible that overloading can cause. So remember that overloading also, underloading also can cause uh, rotator cuff tendinopathy. Okay. So... Thank you, doctor, for this answer. Uh, what specific assessment skills or background knowledge the graduating or the junior physios should have to diagnose tendinopathy? Is there any specific skills uh, for this? OK. Uh, well, with your routine skills, you can diagnose uh, the patient. But today, I just told you that one of the specialized tests is like belly press test. If the belly press test, you can add on to your routine belly. kind of assessment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that can help you. And if you want to go for the perfect assessment, then as I said, uh, the study is one of the best way to assess the patient and say that, okay, my patient has got pain and disabilities this much, and now my patient is here. So right now, answer to your question is in form of two. Uh, just get acquainted with that belly press test, and second is that study outcome measure. Okay. So that answers the question for today's webinar. Okay. So with this, we have to come to the end of the today's session. So Dr. Subhash, thank you so much for joining us today and providing us with such insight information on shoulder tendinopathy. So I think there is one more question. No, sorry. So thank you, doctor, once more. And also thank you to our wonderful audience. Thank you for joining us today at this webinar. And we look forward to your comments and your participation at future events hosted by the Massa University.
So in case if you have any further queries, you can contact us through MASA website or our social media faculty Facebook page. So thank you, everyone. Have a nice and a pleasant weekend, everyone. Thank, thank you, you, Priya. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Love.